Hello everyone, once again, welcome to today's Psyomics webinar. Today we are going to have an amazing talk by Dr. Christopher M. Taylor on the topic of metagenomics and microbial communities, which is one of the very much popular topic of this era. We will be waiting for four to five minutes more so that more people can join in and soon we will be beginning with today's session so once again thank you everyone for tuning in today so stick around tight grab your seats and we will begin with today's very exciting session very shortly All right, so hello everybody. Good morning to the people who are joining from the other part of the world and good evening, good afternoon to the people who are located in the other parts. I welcome you all to today's Psyomics Student Club webinar. Psyomics brings you expert webinars every month. And in this sort of webinars, we talk about some of the most popular topics in today's world, be it in the domain of life sciences, bioinformatics, omics, and any other field. We are excited to talk about and learn from the experts about these exciting new fields. So it gives me immense pleasure to see all of you today who have joined us for this particular webinar. So without any further ado, let's begin with today's Psyomics session. Let me introduce myself to begin with. My name is Subrajit Barua. I'm the scientific outreach coordinator at Pine Biotech and also the president of the Psyomics Student Club. And Ms. Ruthvi Vaja is the vice president of our student club. Psyomics is more than a club, it's a community. It's a huge family of more than 1,000 students from different countries in the world with more than 20 experts and scientists and researchers who share guide and mentor us and we also boast a large 30 plus rich alumni network from different universities who have been a part of our community for a long long time and now they are contributing from the knowledge and the expertise that they have gained from different experiences different projects different researchers they are now applying it in their work in the in the domain of bioinformatics that gives us immense pleasure and immense pride psyomics is as i mentioned a huge community of bioinformatics and data science enthusiasts all across the world we have people who are interested in various applications of bioinformatics and omics such as infectious diseases microbes and microbiome neuroscience plant science precision oncology, and even the most recent fields of omics and bioinformatics, 
namely astrobiology and space omics. The goal of Psyomics Club is to clarify the concepts of bioinformatics, give each other insights on the tools of bioinformatics and how to use them to help each other get started with their research projects and also to gain experience on data science skill sets. But how do we achieve this goal of ours? Well, let me introduce you to Omics Logic. Omics Logic is a community with the goal to provide training in bioinformatics, enabling independent research guided mentors and peer example projects so that students can benefit the most out of their learning experience. Omics Logic also supports developing a growing community such as the Psyomics Club with shared passion for data driven research and appreciation of citizen science projects. And finally, Omics Logic enables students, clinicians, and faculty of all backgrounds to develop novel and independent research using latest technology in life and data sciences. In the month of January 2022, we are observing the metagenomics month we have had various webinars workshops and training programs dedicated to the field of metagenomics that ran across the month of january but what is metagenomics well as a, as you might be familiar with metagenomics deals with the study of the microbial world the microbes microbial communities and their interactions but the study of microbes, or as we call it microbiology, is not a recent field at all. In fact, it is one of the oldest fields of science, which be began way back in the 1600s, when the first microscopic organism was observed under the compound microscope. Since then, various scientists, students, and communities have largely contributed to the rapid development and understanding of this vast field of science, which today has taken the shape and form of metagenomics, which goes hand in hand with microbiology. As we have learned about it more and developed a bigger and wider picture of microbes, we have understood that it's not the individual microbes that play a role or define the phenotypic changes that we see. Instead, they, it is a community or a colony of various microbes residing together, such as bacteria, fungi, and viruses, as you see, can see on the slide, residing on your skin pores. These microbes not only reside together, but also communicate with one another through various processes, such as one of them is called quorum sensing. As we have gained insights into these sort of interactions, and largely developed an idea of how microbial communities can shape and affect our well-being. One of the major landmarks in the development of these ex experiences, understanding and knowledge was the American Gut Project. In this particular project, huge data samples was collected from many participants all across the United States of America and these samples were analyzed to understand the population of microbiome residing in our gut. We found out what are the factors that define these colonies, these communities, and how they in turn shape our lives. And as we developed and looked into more insights, we kind of understood that these microbial communities not only shape the functionality of our gut or the digestive system but also plays an important role in deciding various other physiological and cognitive behaviors of organisms such as this one the study or analyze analysis of the gut microbiome led us to discover its relation with the behavioral pattern of organism mice in this case and that gave us insights into the gut brain axis. This is a very interesting study that was done where we identified how the community of microbes living inside the organism's gut can dictate the behavior of this organism. And it gives me immense pleasure to announce to all of you that today for this webinar, we have 
one of the authors of this exciting research paper with us as our guest speaker. So without any further ado, let me introduce to all of you, Dr. Christopher M. Taylor, Associate Professor of the Department of Microbiology, Immunology and Parasitology, Louisiana State University Health Sciences Center as the guest speaker for today's webinar of Psyomics. Let me introduce our speaker for today's session. So Dr. Taylor joined LSU HSC New Orleans in December 2012 as an associate professor in the Department of Microbiology, Immunology and Parasitology. He is a founding member of the Microbial Genomics Resource Group and has built an informatics laboratory at the School of Medicine focused on microbial community sequencing, analysis, and visualization. He was appointed in July 2016 as the director of the Bioinformatics, Biostatistics, and Computational Biology Core of the Louisiana Biomedical Research Network, LBRN, and was awarded tenure from LSU HSC New Orleans in 2017. Dr. Taylor co-organizes an annual conference on bioinformatics and computational biology for LBRN, and his research laboratory maintains several terabytes of sequence data and designs innovative software systems for visualization and analysis of high throughput sequencing experiments. He also serves as the contact PI for a recently awarded NSF grant that was utilized to acquire and establish a high performance computing cluster called Tigerfish for computational biology and bioinformatics research at LSU HSC New Orleans. Dr. Taylor's research interests currently focuses on dynamic changes in the vaginal microbiota associated with various STIs, including PV, chlamydia, and HIV. So without wasting any further time, I would like to transfer this virtual podium to today's guest speaker, Dr. Christopher M. Taylor. Dr. Taylor, the stage is all yours, and welcome to Psyomics. How are you doing? Thank you. Um, I'm going to see if I can get my screen share going. Yep, we can see your screen well. Is it in all... presentation mode? Yeah. All right. All good to go. So um, thanks for uh, the, in the uh, invitation to speak and uh, the introduction. Um, as as was said, my name is Christopher Taylor, and I'm an associate professor at the Louisiana State uh, Health Sciences Center in New Orleans and the School of Medicine. And uh, my background is actually in computer science, and I got involved in working with genomics in the early 2000s, soon after the human genome was sequenced. And so I come at this, um, this field from a computational perspective. So I, I like to kind of think about computational biology as bridging the gap between the fields of computing and biology and, and bioinformatics in particular requires the application of a computing technology and programming to solve biological problems. And in, in my lab in particular, we often have people who come from either side, um, from either of these fields and they bring unique perspectives depending upon what their background is. So my major focus of, of the work that I do is the human microbiome. Uh, we also study a lot of environmental samples and we look at animal models, but most of my work um, and my research tries to attack problems that are uh, associated with human health and disease because we are in the School of Medicine at Louisiana State University. And as, as was said, the human body is covered in bacteria. You have bacteria that lives on the surface of your skin, in your nose, in your mouth, your ear, your lungs, your stomach, your intestines, and the reproductive tract. And those communities of bacteria can be significant factors in health and disease. And indeed, some diseases are actually defined as, as, as a change in those microbial communities. And the NIH has funded uh, since I think 2012, a, uh, uh, an initiative to characterize 
the bacteria that live in and upon the body called the Human Microbiome Project, and that has had uh, several iterations since it was initiated. So in terms of how we refer to uh, the terminology, when we say microbiota, that refers to an ecological community of organisms. Some of them are commensal and some of them are symbiotic and others pathogenic. This definition came out of the Human Microbiome Project Working Group. And technically, microbiota includes not only bacteria, but also other microbiological organisms such as archaea, protists, fungi, and viruses. However, often when people use the term microbiota, they implicitly mean just the bacteria because that is one of the more often studied um, areas. And then if we say microbiome, then definitionally that technically refers to the collective genomes of all the microorganisms that make up a given environmental niche as opposed to microbiota, which is supposed to just refer to the organisms themselves. But often these terms are used fairly interchangeably and, and I use them interchangeably myself, even though that definitionally they have different connotations. Then there's also this a more interesting idea of a holobiont, which refers to the host organism plus all of the symbiotic microbes that live in and upon it. And that sort of way of looking at things leads to a, a recasting of the traditional theory of evolution called the hologenome theory of evolution, which views not only the host organisms as evolving over time, but also the community of microbes that live in and upon those host organisms have also evolved together over time. Then there's this term dysbiosis, which you've probably heard, and it's really used as a catch-all term for some form of microbial imbalance that occurs in one of the sites on the body. Normally, the healthy community that is normal at a given location, it becomes somehow deranged, and the species that normally make up that community decrease in abundance and allow for opportunistic species to grow. Most commonly, dysbiosis is discussed in terms of the gastrointestinal tract, which is gut dysbiosis, but that concept can actually affect any of the common sites of microbial colonization. In particular, I look a lot at, at vaginal dysbiosis. The change in this community of organisms or this dysbiosis, it can lead to or it can be the result of a disease and possible therapies for dysbiotic states are antibiotics, which will kill ver a variety of, of bacteria, probiotics, whereby you're trying to add back so-called good bacteria, or even a more extreme treatment, FMT, which stands for fecal microbiota transfer. And that's actually a, a technique that's been used fairly successfully to treat uh, recurrent antibiotic resistant Clostridium difficile infection. So in terms of genomics technology, DNA sequencing is the major tool that we use, and it's the process of determining the identity and the order of the nucleotides in a given piece of genetic material, whether that's DNA or it's cDNA from an RNA um, molecule. And the term genomics is the study of the complete genome of a selected organism. And that includes all the DNA sequences and all of the genes of that organism in question. So then when you get um, to the term metagenomics, it actually adds in not only the host organism, but as was said, studying the genetic material from all the organisms. And with all the recent advances that have occurred in DNA sequencing technologies, they've brought about a revolution in genomics over the past decade. And so the best way of visualizing this is a, a graph that the NHGRI, the National Human Genome Research Institute maintains. And this graph shows from the year 2000, the cost of sequencing basically. So this is the cost per megabase of, of sequence. And so um, if you look at this, 
way back in 2000, the sequencing was done via a technique called Sanger sequencing. That was really the, the primary method for doing DNA sequencing. And that technology had been around since the late 70s and early 80s. So it had dominated the field of DNA sequencing for over 20 years. And you can see that it was uh, fairly expensive to sequence a uh, megabase of DNA. Um, you know, this is $10,000 up here at the very top of, of the screen. And that's what it cost back in 2000. See if I can hide some of these bars, floating meeting controls. Okay. And so as time went on uh, from 2000 to about 2007, the reduction in cost of DNA sequencing was roughly following what's called Moore's law, which is a, an observation, not so much a law, but an observation in computing that in the 80s and 90s and 2000s, the cost of computing was decreasing and roughly being cut in half about every 18 months. Well, the cost of DNA sequencing was also being cut in half about every 18 months and was following this white line. But suddenly in about 2007, 2008, this reduction in cost of sequencing really accelerated <clears throat> and far outpaced even Moore's law, which is, is very um, impressive because we know how, how much computing power and, and the cost of computing has dropped over the course of the last 40 or 50 years. Well, the cost of sequencing was even dropping at a much more rapid pace until about nowadays in the last two, three years, you can sequence a megabase of DNA, which is a million base pairs for about a cent. Um, this is all on a log scale, by the way. So this reduction in the cost of sequencing has obviously opened up the possibility of people being able to afford to use sequencing to tackle many problems that couldn't have been tackled even, say, 10 years ago. So metagenomics is um, essentially extending the concept of genomics which focuses on a single organism to look at all of the organisms that live in a community. Organisms that live in communities and interact, if you wanna study those communities, you need to look across all the genomes of the organisms living in it. And that is by definition what metagenomics does. It's the study of metagenomes or genetic material that is sampled directly from a given environment. And this allows us to study communities of organisms directly in their natural environment. You just sample the DNA that you find, regardless of what organism it comes from, and you sequence it. And this bypasses the need for isolating particular organisms that you wanna study and cultivating them in the lab, because we found that a lot of the organisms that we find in the environment, in the natural environment are fairly resistant to cultivation in the lab. So the, the primary tool that we have used and have used in the past to study um, these metagenomes is what's called 16S ribosomal RNA. This is a gene and the schematic on this slide is the uh, 16S ribosomal RNA gene from an organism called Thermus thermophilus. And essentially, um, the important thing about this gene is that it's, a high, it's got some highly conserved areas. This gene is essential for life. And so there are various parts of this gene where the DNA sequence is nearly identical across all bacteria. And that allows for so-called universal PCR primers to be designed to those highly conserved regions such that you can take DNA taken from an environment which may have come from all kinds of different bacteria, and you can amplify just this one gene from those bacterial species. This gene is also important because in between these highly conserved regions are what are called hypervariable regions. And these are regions that are less conserved and they have more species specific uh, variation. And so the signatures or the DNA sequence that's found in between 
these highly conserved areas that falls in these hypervariable regions allows for you to then go back and match against the database and figure out which bacterium each of your 16S ribosomal RNA molecules that you've sequenced have come from. So this method, I like to call it a bacterial census because all it does is it goes in, takes material from a community, amplifies it and just tries to answer the question, which bacteria are there and who are they? What type of bacteria and in what abundance? And so if you, if you look at the 16S ribosomal RNA and you stretch it out, it's about 1500 base pairs or more long. And if you look at the variability of it in 50 base pair windows, this is what you get. So the y-axis is higher is increasing variability. And so you have all these areas that are low variability, but they're interspersed with these high variability areas. And the high variability or hypervariable regions have been named V1, V2, V3, V4, V5, all the way up through V9. And they correspond to these peaks. And so what we'll do in order to perform such a bacterial census, we will design a primer, let's say in this area, which is highly conserved, and another primer in this area. And then we will PCR amplify the entire amplicon in between, which includes the V3 hypervariable region. And then we'll sequence it and use the sequence of the V3 hypervariable region to match back to a 16S database to figure out which bacteria were there and in what quantities. Now, there's another more powerful technique, but also more expensive, which is called shotgun metagenomics. And this is often what people mean when they say metagenomics, even though technically metagenomics refers to the concept of studying these microbial communities. But what shotgun metagenomics is, is it, you take the same type of sample, you just take all the DNA you find in an environment, but instead of amplifying up just this one gene from all the bacterial organisms, you actually sequence all the DNA. And when you sequence all the DNA, you are gonna get DNA from the host organism if you were sampling from say the surface of the skin, or um, if you're sampling in a, an environmental area, like in the soil, you may get DNA from animals that live there, but also you're gonna get DNA from the bacteria that's there, fungi, viruses, everything. And then you just shotgun it up, which means basically mechanically fragmented to small pieces that can be sequenced. And then you take a look at what was there. And this has the advantage that it's, it's, fair, it's unbiased compared to 16S because 16S, you have the PCR step, which can bias what you find where shotgun metagenomics, you're just sequencing everything and you're not PCR amplifying it beforehand. Now, that has its pluses and minuses. One of the minuses of that is that if you are taking a sample from a host, let's say you're taking a, a sample from the surface of the skin, you're gonna get a lot of DNA that is host, and you're also gonna get some bacteria, you're gonna get some fungi, viruses, and so on. Well, if you're primarily interested in the, the microbial organisms, much of your sequencing effort is actually gonna to go towards the host. It can be up, depending on what type of sample you have, it can be up to 90 plus percent of your sequencing might be human, let's say, if you're taking a microbial sample from a human. But, so you may have to do a lot more sequencing in order to answer the question that you want to answer. But if you think back to that cost of sequencing dropping as much as it has, that allows you to do uh, a lot more sequencing for less cost. So, but one of the things that I want to highlight is, is and we're, we're looking at this in terms of a project where we've done both 16S ribosomal RNA sequencing and we've also done shotgun metagenomics on the same samples. And one thing that you get is when you match the 16S ribosomal RNA back to databases, often you can only unambiguously determine the genus of the organisms that are present. 
you don't get down to the species level very often. Often you get stuck at the genus level. And that's just because the 16S sequence may be equally close to many different species of the same genus. But with shotgun metagenomics, if you're primarily interested in the taxonomic composition, the majority of your reads, you can get to species level or even potentially beyond to strain level. So that is a major advantage of using shotgun metagenomics. And so I'll just show you an example. This is um, one of the subjects that we did 16S ribosomal RNA sequencing on. And this is a, this is a study of uh, women and it's, it's looking at their vaginal microbiome. And some of the women come down with a dysbiotic condition, which is called bacterial vaginosis. And this is a condition where, as I said before, the normally dominating species of organisms in the environment start to become less prevalent and other opportunistic organisms come in and start to take over. And so what this, this heat map is showing is actually it's a time course and these are days of the study. So this time course where we started sequencing was day 36 for this particular subject. And we went all the way through day 66. And on the x-axis are the different organisms that we found. And uh, we tried to classify as far down as we could. We could get to species level in many cases. Um, but all, so lots of times we're only left at like, say, the genus level. But what you can see from this particular subject is that originally her, her vaginal microbiome is dominated by a couple of species of lactobacillus. So this one, lactobacillus crispatus, and this other one, lactobacillus gasseri, are primarily the dominant organisms. There's a, a number of other things here. But up through about day 49, this is what dominates. Then we have some metadata up here and you can see that on day 50, this subject reports that menses starts. Well, when menses starts, she starts to lose the dominance of almost immediately, really, she loses the dominance of Lactobacillus crispatus and Jensenii, and a number of other organisms start to come in and proliferate. And then continuing along, she reports sexual activity on day 56, after which suddenly her lactobacillus is completely gone. And now the dominant organisms are Gardnerella vaginalis, which is a bacteria that's been implicated in bacterial vaginosis, along with um, uh, Prevotella bivia, and Adipobium vaginae, and a few other organisms, Anaerococcus tetradius. And so she ends up at this point in a state of having BV. And this is something that we measure with what's called a Nugent score. And as long as the Nugent score is three or below, we say she has a normal microbiota. But once it rises to four to six, we'll say that the woman has an intermediate microbiome and if she gets to a seven or above, she's diagnosed with BV. And so you can see that she jumps from this normal microbiota to suddenly a BV microbiota, which persists for several days. But then once menses ceases, she goes back to a lactobacillus dominant microbiota. So essentially her normally dominating Crispatus and Jensenii come back and once again, dominate her community. So the interesting thing here is that for this same subject, we chose a subset of samples leading up to her diagnosis of BV, and we did shotgun sequencing on them. So due to cost considerations, we didn't do every day, we did every other day. So we did day 47, 49, 51, 53, 55, and then day 57, which was the day she was diagnosed with BV. And when we look at that using shotgun methods, we find very similar results. Now, one of the drawbacks that you can have with shotgun uh, sequencing for metagenomics is that 
the matching to the databases might not be as, as, it can be more precise, but there are a lot more blind spots because not all of the bacteria have had their whole genome sequenced. Whereas the 16S ribosomal RNA sequences have been studied very thoroughly and often will be available for you to match against. But what you see is very similar to what we saw with the 16S is that, you know, initially she's dominated by this lactobacillus crispatus and lactobacillus gastri. And then you also see here that she has another species of lactobacillus, which didn't pop up in the 16S, lactobacillus vaginalis. And that's just because it, it, it's close enough to the other organisms that it's not able to be discerned from those other organisms by 16S, but you can by shotgun. And then what you see is that the uh, Gardnerella vaginalis starts to dominate here and also Prevotella bivia and a few other organisms. But notice here that the granularity of detail is finer. You can actually see that the Gardnerella vaginalis was there at low levels, even when she was dominated by lactobacilli. When you look back at these graphs, you can also see that it was there at fairly low levels leading up. But you can see a progressive ramp up here of adipobium vaginae, which really dominates on the day of BV, but you can see it, it ramps up here. You can also see a ramping up, but at a quicker rate of Prevotella bivia. So these are sort of just a, an example to show you the types of things that you can see with shotgun sequencing compared to what you can see with 16S. And we actually did this on three other subjects, um, which I don't have time to show you the data for, but this method allows us to not only look at the bacterial communities, but we also were able to find that there's a little bit of fungal, um, Canada albicans that shows up in one of our subjects. And then there's also some viral sequences. So um, alpha papillomavirus is present in subject K12 and human herpes virus four is present in subject K20. And these are things that you don't find with 16S ribosomal RNA sequencing. So with the shotgun sequencing, we could actually go in and um, look at, you know, not only the- Sorry. Eh? Okay, uh, I think somebody's off of mute that doesn't mean to be off of mute. So when we look at all the data that we got from our shotgun metagenomics, as I said, the majority of the sequence was human. Actually, 84.62% of our sequencing data mapped to human, whereas only 12.4% mapped to bacteria and 2.92% mapped to other microbial organisms. And then if you zoom in on the other microbial organisms, 71% of that sequence was fungal, 27% protozoan, a uh, little over a percent archaeal, and then very little of it, about less than 1% was viral. If we so zoom in on that viral sequence, you can see a variety of different viruses we found. We found alpha papillomavirus, uh, human gamut herpes virus. Those are the things that showed up on those heat maps I showed you. We found some other viral sequences as well. And then one of the things that we're really interested in is bacteriophage. So a subset of the viral sequences was bacteriophage. And we found a few lactobacillus phages, um, that's the majority of what we found. And we found a, a number of other phages. So this just gives you an idea of all the different things that you can see when you, when you pay for the additional uh, cost of doing shotgun metagenomic sequencing. And I'd imagine, you know, that the, the, the thing that's popping into your head right now, or at least should be, is uh, what is the cost differential? Well, basically for us, um, I'm a, one of the founding members of our, micro, uh, of our metagenomic resources at LSU Health Sciences. We have a group that's called the Microbial Genomics Resource Group. 
And we, we perform these kinds of assays for people around the world. Uh, primarily, we work with people in our general area, but we've done sequencing of samples for places as far as Puerto Rico and, and even some places in Europe. Um, and our cost, it cost us about 40 to $45 to process a single sample for 16S. So that includes DNA isolation, uh, amplicon preparation, and indexing and sequencing. So that's all the molecular aspects of it. Whereas if we're doing shotgun sequencing, it's going to cost us at least $200 per sample. And that is entirely dependent upon how much depth of sequencing is needed. So if you need more depth, you want really deep shotgun metagenomics, we may, it may cost us 300, maybe $400. Uh, shallow shotgun could be $200. And it's partly dependent upon what sequencing platforms we have available. But I, I have a, um, a web server, which I, I host. And if you, you know, roll, run over to that web page. Sorry, I'm having problems completing your request. Please try again later. If you continue to have issues, please contact support. That's Alexa. All right, so if you run over to Metagenomics, this website, what you're gonna find is various links. So I have some recorded lectures on informatics. I have a link to my lab page, and then I have a link to the microbial genomics resource group. And the microbial genomics resource group, if you, you know, visit that webpage, we have a bunch of information there about what we do, who we are, uh, former members of the group, um, a variety of news items, and then importantly, probably the most useful, um, you know, after you get through all the publications, is this cost and sample submission, which lists out all of the different services that we have available and the prices for each. And then we have some sample submission guidelines. But I just wanted to you know, highlight that, um, that that resource is available and we work with people all around the world. Um, as I also mentioned there on that same website, the lectures button takes you to a series of lectures that I conducted several years ago that have been recorded and are available via streaming. Um, these recorded lectures persist and are available for viewing on demand. I did a lecture series in general on uh, an introduction to informatics, and then another one that was an introduction to microbial communities. <clears throat> I also, uh, as was mentioned, I, I uh, helped co-organize an annual conference on uh, bioinformatics and computational biology. We just run last year our eighth annual conference on computational biology and bioinformatics. That was last April. Um, the link is here um, and I'll provide these slides for, for distribution by Pine Biotech. Um, and we had a whole session in the last conference that was on the NIH Strides Initiative. And this is an initiative that NIH has kicked off to uh, help with the transition to cloud computing. And we had a keynote talk from Amazon Web Services, which is one of the providers in NIH Strides, and another keynote from the Google Cloud Research Group, which is another provider of uh, NIH Strides Compute. We had other eminent bioinformatics and computational biology speakers. And these topics that they covered uh, included the COVID-19 pandemic modeling, gut microbiome, uh, herpes virus, and the role of statistics in epigenetics research. And so here was the flyer from our conference from 2021, all the speakers that we had. And we're very soon gonna start uh, organization of the coming 2022 conference. And likely that'll be virtual due to the ongoing pandemic. It was virtual last year and the 2020 conference actually had to be canceled because we didn't have time to pivot 
to a virtual format. So my research lab, just to give you an idea at LSU, um, one of the uh, sort of tenets of the lab when I built it is that I wanted it to be an open uh, environment. So I didn't put up partitions or cubicles or anything like that because I wanted to promote uh, the collaboration between all of the students and, and postdocs and researchers that work in my lab. And that's served very well. Um, essentially people sit around the perimeter work at their workstations, but if they run into an issue, they can just turn around to their neighbor and, um, you know, ask and see if they, if they have an op, an opinion on how to resolve the issue. So I've had several people who work in the lab and have, uh, rotated through it and ongoing research projects. Uh, most of my research has shifted to be in the vaginal microbiota and its interaction with STIs. I have a, a major study on uh, the chlamydia, um, trachmatis, that virus, and, uh, and essentially how the microbiome interacts with natural clearance of the infection. I have another uh, big project that's, uh, that's running in South Africa right now on uh, adverse birth outcomes um, and that interaction with the microbiota. And then I have my primary focus on uh, bacterial vaginosis. I have a couple grants working on that. And then uh, we just got a new grant awarded where we're gonna look at bacterial vaginosis and testosterone use in transgender men. And we're just about to undergo uh, start enrollment for that study. And most of this work is actually with my, my primary collaborator, Christina Musney, who's at U University of Alabama, Birmingham. Um, I'm also a member of the Center for Clinical and Translational Research at the University of Alabama, Birmingham. And I'm a, a member of the Louisiana Biomedical Research Network here uh, that is flagshipped by the LSU campus in Baton Rouge, but extends throughout Louisiana. Uh, as was mentioned early on, I recently got a, an NSF grant, which we've used to um, establish a high performance computing cluster at the School of Medicine and the LSU Health Sciences Center here in New Orleans. It's a tigerfish cluster. Here's a picture I took soon after it was deployed. It's got 1,440 total compute cores and 193.6 teraflops, uh, 36 compute nodes, each of that which has 192 gigabytes of RAM. It has a very uh, large RAM memory node, which has 1.5 terabytes of RAM, and it's got a GPU node as well. So it, it, it serves a variety of purposes for us and it allows us to perform some of the very compute intensive shotgun metagenomics analysis that we need to do. Lastly, uh, there, LSU Health Sciences, this has been in progress for a while. Uh, my colleague here, Chendo Hicks in the genetics department has spearheaded a bioinformatics track uh, within a master's program in biomedical sciences. And, and we had intended to start enrollment of that program a few years ago, but the COVID-19 pandemic intervened and we now have pushed the planned start of the program to next fall with an application deadline in April. Uh, but you know, again, the start of this program is really dependent upon our evolving COVID restrictions and results of applicants to the program, whether we get that started or not. But the program, its purpose will be to integrate uh, instruction in computer programming, bioinformatics and computational biology, along with the myriad applications to biomedical research that we do at the LSU Health Sciences Center. And uh, with that, hopefully I'm somewhat on time and I will have an opportunity to take some questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Taylor. It was a really enlightening session for all of us. We got to know about a lot of th things about metagenomics, a lot of research applications and various challenges and the ways to address them as well. Thank you so much for 
your time and your presentation. We do have a few questions from our participants, which I will be taking up one by one, and you can address them. So here's the first question that was asked by our audience. And it, it, he says, was the patient of your study was under some other medications because during her menses, menses, her biomass of lactobacillus had almost disappeared. But in the same period, she had other dominant bacterium colonies. Is this linked with the physical presence of bacteria in the body or was the lactobacillus phages that you showed later responsible for this depletion? So I will say, uh, not that we know of, so she, so this was a prospective study and women were enrolled in the study and followed for 90 days. And a, a, an exclusion criteria for enrollment in the study was having an STI or other, uh, or being on any kind of antibiotics within the past 14 days. And so everyone who was enrolled in the study was healthy and, and not on other medications at the time but this is a fairly high risk population. And so it's possible that due to, you know, sexual activity or other, other things that she may have gotten an STI during the study um, because they weren't being tested throughout the study for that. Essentially the samples were collected for up to 90 days. And then when the samples were processed, if a woman was found to have bacterial vaginosis, she was called in to get treatment. But the samples that we would have worked on would have all been before that. So all of the data that I showed you would have been without any kind of, um, you know, antibiotic treatment or, or other drug treatment uh, being administered prior to when the, those samples were taken or sequenced. So we do think that the phage might have a role and that's actually something that we're working on right now. That's why I'm so interested in the results um, that we're that we're working on, we've got a manuscript that's uh, that's about to go in for review. All right. So uh, let's expand from that point, as where you said that depletion of microbes due to antibiotics and the administration of probiotics. So we know that probiotics are not really um, verified by the FDA. But in your opinion, how effective they are and what are the ways in which probiotics are being improved through modern research? So I'm very much at this point in time, uh, a probiotic skeptic, if you will. I think a lot of the market for probiotics is a little bit of snake oil because we don't, as a scientific community, know enough to really play God in the sense that when you have various conditions or dysbiosis, we don't know exactly what needs to be put back to fix that. And that's the best evidence of that is C. diff infections. Um, people have tried, you know, the, the, the standard attempts at, at resetting a, a C. diff infection is antibiotics. And often it kills a bunch of organisms and makes the condition worse. Well, you try probiotics, you try all kinds of things. The thing that's been successful is fecal microbiota transplant. So take fecal material, a healthy bacterial community from a healthy donor and transplant it into someone suffering from C. diff. And that's had a almost 90% effectiveness rate. And the reason is, well, you put that healthy bacteria back. Well, if we knew exactly what needed to be added, we could get around the idea of having to take fecal material and implant it but we don't really understand at that, at that level yet what needs to be put back. So, you know, are probiotics good? They probably are, um, but you really need to know which probiotics and what they're gonna do. At this time, they're not regulated by the FDA. They're considered like nutritional supplements, you know, so it's, it's hard to really know what you're taking and what the results are going to be. All right. Thank you so much for the answer. Here's another question from our audience. He asked, did you perform an in silico PCR test or some sort of evaluation to really get an insight on the primer coverage for the 16S databases? 
uh, before choosing the primer set and can you please share your thoughts on how in silico tests can be done to get maximum coverage for amplicon sequencing so what i'll point you to because it's a very involved answer is we actually did publish a paper several years ago which was an in silico analysis of several different primer sets um, and you know my name is very common so if you look for christopher taylor you're going to find people all over the the, the gamut but um, you know a more uncommon name that was my co-author on this paper was Elliot Lefkowitz. And if you, if you search for him, you'll, you'll be able to find the paper. It's, it, it's got in silico in its title. And we did a whole analysis on the best primer sets. And we ended up, what we use in our microbial genomics resource group is we, we study the V4 region. And part of that's due to the limitations of the sequencing technology we're using in, in terms of how long of a region we can study. More, more length, if you can cover more hypervariable regions is better. And in particular, uh, Pacific Biosciences has the, you know, they have a platform where you can, you can basically sequence the whole 16S molecule and you can get down to species level most of the time. And they're really pushing that technology now. We just, uh, we don't have that sequencing technology in our lab. Uh, well, all right, definitely uh, it's a good idea to check out all the resources and the papers that you've published and kind of uh, continuing from that particular point, there's a question in the chat and it is about sharing the link to your platform that you had mentioned and your website and he just wants to confirm it. Is it metagenomics.lsuhsc.com or not? So it would be good no, if you can share yeah, let me type it in, metagenomics.lsuhsc.edu. Um, that should get you there. All right, well, that's great. Thank you so much for sharing. And um, here's the last question that I have for you. So you mentioned the various sequencing categories and types and their different pros and cons and their challenges. and what, according to you, would be some of the computational challenges that one might face while doing metagenomics research, and what's a good way to address them? Well, so computational challenges, um, 16S ribosomal RNA sequencing and characterization, that analysis is fairly well worked out. There are really good tools that you can use for that, and the um, the analyses aren't super duper compute intensive. You can often do them on a, a desktop workstation, sometimes even a powerful laptop like a MacBook Pro. But once you get the shotgun metagenomic sequencing, you're dealing with a lot more data and there are tools available to process the data. But if you wanna do something fairly um, compute intensive like de novo assembly of your sequencing reads, you really need access to a, a high performance computing cluster like Tigerfish. And that's one of the you know, main applications that we pushed in our, in our grant application to get that platform was that you know, we need this sort of resource to be able to do shotgun metagenomics analysis at scale. All right, well, thank you so much for your answers, Dr. Taylor. And here's another request in the chat to kind of share the link through which our participants can apply for the MS program at LSU that you were talking about. Right, I will see if I can copy it and paste it into the chat. So that link should get you to um, <clears throat> the page about the program itself. And then there's information on that page that allows for um, you to find out where to go to apply. Right, and there's someone who also wants to ask about this MS bioinformatics program that is it a remotely taught program because due to the travel restrictions for COVID and the person being an international student, can he travel to Louisiana right now or? there's a method for distant learning as well. So um, that's to be determined at this point. Uh, Chindo and I have had discussions about that. I, I like the idea of having a um, you know, virtual option. Uh, 
Chindo himself is actually from uh, Africa. And so he has an association with several universities in Africa. And his idea behind the program was that we would have sort of this crossing of, we bring a lot of students here to the US from South African universities. And uh, of course, COVID kind of got in the way of all that. And so everything is still evolving right now. We've had a, 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 a number of new leadership in our graduate school who may be more open to the idea of virtual programs. So we're trying to push that. But for right now, what I was discussing with the fall, um, the plans for that, if we're able to go forward with it, would be to start that program up as an actual normal in-person um, master's program where you have a residency here, uh, where you're here for the education. But in the future, hopefully we'll be able to come to some kind of a balance. Well, all right. Thank you so much, Dr. Taylor, for your time. It was wonderful to have you with us. And your talk was full of insights, full of information. And it was a pleasure to learn from you and also talk to you. Thank you so much for your time. Oh, I see one more, one more question about the tigerfish cluster. How much did it cost to set up? Um, the grant that we got from NSF was a $400,000 grant. And I think it cost us about $360,000 was spent on a, uh, the cluster itself. And then the other was on student workers and, and various other things to get everything going. Yep, that's a really cost intensive investment, but definitely it helps a lot of analysis and the computational power it brings to the research lab is tremendous. So thank you so much, Dr. Taylor, for your time. And it was great to know a lot of things about LSU, HSC and your research. For my dear audience, any questions that you might have regarding the MSc program in LSU, you can definitely check out the page shared by Dr. Taylor and you can also email the persons involved in the research programs and the admission centers. So that way you can definitely learn more about the program and also get answered to all your questions. So moving on with uh, the last bit of today's webinar that I have for you. And since I, I see that all of you are pretty much interested about this exciting domain of omics that is known as metagenomics, and you are also excited just like me, I would like to introduce you to the omics logic training course on metagenomics. And it's a very in-depth learning experience, a program developed in association with Dr. Taylor and other organizations at Fine Biotech. The Omics Logic training is an integration of interactive sessions, both live and asynchronous, self guided study materials, and practical assignments on the TBioInfo platform. The TBioInfo platform is an AI enabled cloud based analysis platform where people like you and me, who are more biologists than coders, would not have to worry about the problems or the difficulties that we might have to face with coding. So here with the point and click interface of the TBioInfo platform, you can do your analysis very easily and very quickly. And all of this is taught in these programs and these self-guided study materials. In the omics logic metagenomics program, you get to learn about omics technologies in microbiome studies, both from the perspective of a sequencing based approach and also in, from the perspective of mass spec based approach. You also get to learn about microbiome functions, differentiation of the immune system and food digestion and nutrition and all the way to its function in the prevention of pathogens invasion. And as I was telling you, the hands on practical aspect, you also get to learn about Amplicon data sequencing through the data to pipeline, which is embedded in the TBioInfo server. And you get to learn the data analysis by actually performing on a real data set taken from a publicly available data. Talking about publicly available data, you will definitely get insights into the databases where you can find such data for your projects and analysis to get started with. So 
databases like Green Genes, Silva, NCBI, RDP are some great resources for your metagenomics projects. And the idea of doing all of these hands on learning is to actually push you or get yourself ready for a research fellowship or a research project where you can get enrolled for an internship somewhere or get started with your own project and complete it and apply all the knowledge, the techniques, the skills that you learn as a part of these omics logic training courses. Talking about fellowship, here's an example of a research project completed by one of our research fellows, whose name is Ms. Vedika Rai from Amity University, Noida, and her work deals with the transcriptomics of COVID-19. Talking about COVID-19, very soon in the month of February, we will be launching a dedicated program where we will be talking about bioinformatics for infectious diseases, taking the help and the data sets from COVID-19 and other infectious diseases such as malaria and Ebola, and understand its origin, its pathogenesis, and also push forward towards developing possible therapeutics for these infectious diseases. Talking about other specialized courses that are offered by Omics Logic platform, there's precision oncology, an introductory course to bioinformatics, which gives you the idea of what biology and informatics integration looks like and really helps you understand the logic behind omics. There's a dedicated program on omics logic genomics and genomics in the virtual lab where you get to work hands on again and develop more skills in genomics using Python and R coding languages. We also provide omics logic transcriptomics, data science for biomedical data sets and other programs which gives you a holistic experience and skill set to get started with your bioinformatics project and to get started with your scientist career now here's an announcement which i would like to mention about our partnerships with louisiana state university and as a result of this partnership we are bringing several free courses for the students of lsu to get enrolled and to get experienced in various courses such as bioinformatics, transcriptomics, genomics, and metagenomics. Another great collaboration that we have recently established is with NEPI, which stands for National Association of Idea Principal Investigators, which covers 23 states in the United States of America and Puerto Rico. As a result of this collaboration, Pine Biotech would also provide free training to the students who are associated with the NEPI network. And this is a great opportunity for you to leverage the resources provided by Pine Biotech. Talking about our international collaborations, recently we signed a massive MOU between Amity University and Pine Biotech, which resulted in forming a great collaborative partnership between Amity University Noida campus. And the real focus of this partnership is to bring industry and academic internships for students in India and elsewhere, where students can get the flavor of the applications of bioinformatics in industry as well as lab-based academic research. Talking about collaborations, there was another great collaboration established between Pine Biotech and FABA, which stands for the Federation of Asian Bioinformatics Associations. So this is a huge network of the giants in biotechnology and bioinformatics in the entire Asian continent. And as a result of this par partnership and collaboration, we will be also able to bring various exciting opportunities for the students who are based and located in Asia. And in the days to come, you will definitely get more news of various events that we will be launching in association with FABA. <clears throat> so having said that, it's a good, op good idea for all of you to get in touch with us so that you'd never miss anything that we have to share. So we are present on each and every social media platform that you are. So feel free to get in touch with us and follow us in any of the social media handles that you are present in. And in that way, you can stay in touch with us, get to know about any of our events that is coming up, starting from internships to fellowships to any other webinar such as this one. So as a part of Psyomics, we organize these sort of guest speaker webinars every month, twice every month. 
in the month of November, we had a session on bioinformatics and data science. In December, we focused on study abroad strategies and tactics, how to, how to get a scholarship for studying abroad and things like that. In January, we are covering metagenomics. And very soon, we will be having the month of February, where we will be having dedicated webinars in the domain of bioinformatics and data science. And in March, we will be having a big conference, which is known as Omics Logic Research Symposium, where you will have many great scientists and experts in the industry domain come together to share their insights, as well as students will get an opportunity to participate in the poster, sub -con poster conference competition. So again, do stay in touch with us through our social media because we will be sharing the call for abstracts for the poster session very soon. And we are looking forward to your submissions for the Omics Logic Research Symposium. Now, finally, I would like to inform you about our next Psyomics session that is going to be held on the 4th of February at 5 p.m. in the standard time. You will be receiving emails for the same. And this session will be taken by Dr. Abhishek Sen Gupta, who is an assistant professor at the Center for Computation and Biology and Bioinformatics at Amity Institute of Biotechnology, Amity University of the Pradesh. And he will be talking about network construction and inference as an elegant approach to understand disease pathogenesis. So once again, it would be great to have you all with us on board for this exciting webinar, which will be done by Dr. Abhishek. Finally, your opinion matters a lot to us, so we would definitely love to hear from you what you feel about our webinars, what things you like, and what are the areas where you think we can improve. So definitely fill out this feedback form. Your opinions will only help us get better from this point of time. Having said that, that's, that brings us to the end of today's webinar. I enjoyed it a lot. I had so many exciting moments from this particular webinar. It was amazing to see all of you present today. Do follow us and join all our social media groups so that we can communicate with one another and help each other and stand by one, stand by one another's journey, which is really the goal of Psyomics Bioinformatics Student Club. So that's it for me because that's all I have for you guys today. If you have any question, feel free to write down in the chat section. I will definitely help you out with anything that you need. And I can see that you need the link for the research symposium. So I will definitely share it with you. And I have also copied your email and I will make sure that our team reaches out to you very soon. So, guys, that brings us to the end of today's Psyomic session. If you have any questions, feel free to put it down in the chat. If not, that's goodbye from all of us today. I really had an amazing time with all of you. Once again, thank you so much, Dr. Chris Taylor, for joining us today and for your time. It was a privilege for all of us to have you as our guest speaker today. Thank you everyone and wish you all the best in life. See you very soon on the 4th of February, 2022. All right, everyone, then good night and have a great day ahead. See you. Bye.